So, good afternoon all. Today I am going, my topic of presentation is diabetic retinopathy changes seen in ultra white field fundus imaging after anti-VEGF therapy. <coughs> diabetic retinopathy leading cause of visual impairment in the world. It is the most common cause of microangiopathy of retinal vasculature. As we all know, microangiopathy is the hallmark of diabetic retinopathy which is causes microvascular leakage and capillary occlusion result in the hypoxia of the retina and release of VEGF. The VEGF is a potent stimulator mm -hmm. of angiogenesis and neovascularization. Even though anti-VEGF is the mainstay of treatment for diabetic macular edema, <coughs> background retinal changes response to the anti-VEGF are seldom assessed. The image here, we can see the comparison of the image uh, visual field. In this, this is a field that has been taken from the conventional fundus picture, which involves a 50 to uh, 55 degree of the field. But in ultra-wide field, it takes about 200 degree of the field. More than 50 degrees is called as wide field and more than 100 is called as ultra-wide field. This is a picture showing an ultra-wide field 200 degree image with an overlay of ETDR7 standard field and uh, the peripheral field. Here we can see that there is uh, ETDR7 standard field and outside the ETDR is called as peripheral field from 4 to 6, which is involving the fi five fields. So, the ultra wide field images identify the peripheral diabetic retinopathy lesions that are not visualized using the 7 standard ETDRS photograph, which, cap which only captures 90 degree of the retina. Hence, immaculate characterization of the presence and distribution of the di diabetic retinopathy lesion across almost all of the retina is possible. My aim and objective are to determine the treatment response of diabetic retinopathy defining and grading lesion in background retina following multiple anti of injections and to look for diabetic retinal changes within the standard ETDRS field and peripheral field outside the ETDRS field using ultra wide field imaging. Materials and methods, it's a hospital based prospective observational study done in 47 eyes of 32 patients uh, based on the uh, Silva PS et al. And, uh, and the subjects are patients present with the diabetic retinopathy who was advised for anti of injection for the treatment for treatment purpose for macular edema. It's conducted in tertiary eye care center in South India for the duration of six months. Inclusion criteria. All cases of diabetic retinopathy age above 18 years who receive intravital anti-VEGF injection for the treatment purpose. Exclusion criteria is the presence of any ocular disease like glaucoma, previous trauma or any other retinal diseases other than diabetic retinopathy. Myopic refractive era more than 6 diopter. I use media opacity. I previously treated with intravital steroids or panadol photocoagulation and recent, any recent intraocular surgery within 3 months. Methodology. Consent is being taken from the patient and after a detailed medical history, slit lamp examination and indirect ophthalmoscopic examination is done. A sequential ultra wide field fundus photographs are taken. The first photographs are taken, uh, treatment naive patient and the second photograph are taken one month after the first dose and the third visit, third photograph are taken one month after the second dose. The total of three photographs are taken for a single patient. The grading of the diabetes is based on using ETDRS classification. These are the lesions that has been studied. In this hemorrhages microaneurysm has been uh, quantitatively calculated by using markers. Other lesions has been uh, calculated by the whether the lesions is present or absent. Hard exudates is quantified based on the picture given below. This is the ETDRS grid and the number of grids that is involved is being calculated and the significance is measured. Coming to the result and discussion, majority of the patients have been age group in 51 to 60 years and major of the pa majority of the patients are diagnosed as moderate NPDR. The effectiveness of treatment, it was uh, found that the lesions like hemorrhages, cotton wool, spot, microaneurysm and hard exudates are clinically significant with a p-value of less than 0.1 but rest of the lesions was uh, not clinically significant. Distribution of the retinal lesion in the white field images, most of the lesions have been distributed within the ETDRS field, majority of the lesion. In the picture uh, table below, below, hard exudates, majority that is 89.3 percentage are seen in the ETDRS field and only 17.2 are seen outside the field. The effectiveness of treatment, the, the treatment was uh, uh, of the severity of the diabetic node was significant. This is one of the patient image before the anti inje inje injection. Here you can see numerous hemorrhages. And this is after the dose, the, the hemorrhages have subsided. There was a statically significant association noticed between the central macular thickness and the p-value. And coming to other treatments, uh, other comparison with other studies, DCR.net protocol has suggested that randomizumab was not inferior to PRP for the treatment for PDR. Silva PS et al. study 
show that only one third of the lesions were uh, dictated on ultraviolet field imaging. And a DCR protocol uh, W trial showed that uh, over two years, Aflibet reduced the risk of development of vision threatening complications severe in PDR. And Sophie Burnett et al. Conclusion and recommendations. Con uh, conclusions of the study was hemorrhages, microaneurysms are being significantly reduced. Ultraviolet field image uh, showed that there is considerable amount of lesions outside the ETDRS field. And the macular edema is significantly reduced. Recommendation there should be large sample size, long term follow up, and there should be a software for the analysis. Um, and these are my references. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, majority it was uh, uh, was used. Uh, no, sir. No, sir. Actually, it was uh, not. Uh, uh. So this is a non-vidriatic um, non uh, this one and also there is a fast acquisition of images and also we can store the data and can be transferred um, and also uh, these can be sequential fundus imaging but the treatment response can be assessed using the ultraviolet field images. No, sir, we cannot do. If it is associated with a wild field fluorescent angiogram, then it we can assess, but at present it is not. Call upon the next presenter, uh, Dr. Atulia CP. Uh, good afternoon, all. My topic for presentation is comparison of efficacy between innovator ranibizumab, aflibercept, and biosimilar ranibizumab in patients with wet age related macular degeneration. So age-related macular degeneration is the leading cause of irreversible central vision loss in older individuals. Presence of choroidal neovascularization defines the wet ARMD. Here a protein called VEGF makes abnormal proliferation of the chorio capillaries which will break through the brush membrane and reach the sub-RP and sub-retinal space. So since the pathogenesis is because of VEGF, the treatment of choice is anti-VEGF injection. In this study, we compared two anti-VEGF drugs. First one is ranibizumab, which inhibits VEGF-A only. Second one is aflibercept, which inhibits VEGF-A, B, and placental growth factor. In ranibizumab, we are comparing two groups, innovator, that is Xendrix, and biosimilar, that is rasumab. So what's a biosimilar, and why we need a biosimilar? A biosimilar is a copy of innovator drug, but large in size and complex, with similar chemical characteristic, efficacy, and safety. Biosimilar manufacturing is not as complex as that of Innovator, so it's comparatively cheaper than Innovator drugs. So what are the concerns with Innovator drugs? First one is cost. As I told, it's costlier than the biosimilar agents, then availability. As we know, anti vegf is also useful in other common conditions like diabetic uh, edema and all. It's always better to keep some alternative drugs to increase the availability of the drugs. So what's the concern with biosimilar agent? It's the safety. When Rasumab was introduced initially in the market, there were many cases of increased inflammation were reported. So safety is an important factor in concern with the biosimilar agent. Coming to my aim, it was it's compare efficacy between innovator ranibizumab, biosimilar ranibizumab, and aflibercept in wet ARMD. Study methodology, it's a prospective single center observational comparative study conducted in a tertiary eye hospital in Kerala. Study duration was six months from December 2022 to June 2023. Sample size was 45, 15 in each group. Inclusion criteria, age above 60 years with ARMD type 1 and 2 on OCT confirmed by FFA. Media clarity, pupillary dilatation and subject cooperation sufficient for fundus photographs. So the initial parameters we assessed were vision, fundus examination, OCT and FFA. Then we gave three loading doses of monthly injections. Then after the, in the follow-up visits, we examined vision, fundus examination, and OCT only. 
that means after every monthly injections that initial 3 months then from the from 3 months from the last injection coming to my observations and results comparison of age age is almost comparable that's around 65 to 66 years for all patients Coming to comparison of vision, here we can see the uh, Lockmar score vision in the y-axis and for the innovative ranibismab group, initially the vision was worse than other two groups. Uh, but initially after the first injection for the innovative ranibismab group, vision improved comparatively better than the other two. But the end of all injections, the, uh, the uh, results were almost comparable. Uh, for uh, the foveal thickness also, uh, my uh, innovative ranibismab group had comparatively increased foveal thickness. Uh, so that also increased better with the first injection but at the end of all three injections all were comparable uh, coming to pigment epithelial detachment uh, the innovator anibismab had more pigment epithelial detachment patients and uh, second the aflibercept uh, coming to at the end we can see coming to the pd flattening effect the aflibercept group that is the green color has almost complete flattening of the uh, uh, flattening effect of the pd so that worked better for the uh, PED for the aflibercept work better. Then comparison of change in SRF, we can see almost uh, comparable for all three groups for SRF and uh, intraretinal fluid also almost all three are comparable. For the uh, biosimilar anibisumab group, uh, we can see uh, there was an uh, increase in the IRF after the second injection but at the end of three injections uh, all were almost comparable only. So this is the OCT changes like uh, we can see the fluid and uh, PED at the end, the vision also improved and the central foveal thickness also improved. Coming to discussion, innovative ranibizumab is comparable with biosimilar ranibizumab in reference to improvement in vision and foveal thickness. This corresponds with the study by Woos et al. and Ratna D. and Roy K. and Giridhar S. and colleagues study. Innovator ranibizumab is comparable with aflibercept in terms of improvement in visual acuity and foveal thickness. It co corresponds with the Gills, and, Gills MC and colleagues study. Biosimilar ranibizumab is comparable with aflibercept in reference to visual outcome and foveal thickness. Comparing the biosimilar ranibizumab and aflibercept group, I didn't get any uh, uh, study. And uh, coming to my limitations, small sample size, short duration of study, so chances of recurrence could not be studied due to the short duration. And innovator ranibizumab group had more edema, the pre-injection status was more edematous. Conclusion, innovator ranibizumab, biosimilar ranibizumab and aflibercept were comparable in terms of improvement of vision and, uh, and foveal thickness and all parameters at the end of all injection. So biosimilar can be used instead of innovator injections with reduced financial burden to the patients and also increase the availability of drugs and no adverse effects noticed in the biosimilar group in our study. Thank you. Okay, good presentation. Uh, how did you calculate the sample size in uh, your patients? Uh, sample size, sir, um, uh, from the uh, parent study uh, uh, using the uh, actually the statistician the, calculated sir, the, the formula and told formula you that these many were enough the, for statistical yeah, significance. Yes, from each group, sir. Okay, and how did you choose patients into the three groups? Uh, sir, actually, uh, when the patients with wet RMD came, we counseled the patient for the uh, three injections. Uh, actually, that um, uh, financial part was a bit concerned for the old patients, but since they had ESI and claims and all, for most of the patients in my study group had uh, these free injections like due, due to their ESI claims and all. So, so it was like self-chosen. Self-chosen injections, sir. Yeah. They went into different groups. Yes, okay. And can you show me, uh, is the presentation on? Okay, I thought in your graphs, yes, the blue line was for the uh, 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 biosimilar. biosimilar sir. To begin with itself, the parameters were lower, the edema was lower, uh, everything was better in that group as compared to the other groups. Uh, yes, sir. Actually, uh, uh, in the innovator anibisabab group, it was uh, comparatively the... Yes, sir. So yes. everywhere you're beginning itself with, uh, you know, you them know, being but, uh, better than the others. So the so, vision and uh, uh, this foveal edema was comparatively worse for the innovator group in my study. That was a limitation as I told you. Thank you, sir. Shall we call upon the third presenter, Dr. Sulakshana L.
good afternoon thank you ksos for this opportunity my, my study topic was uh, outcome of sub threshold micropulse laser in CSCR with subfovial and juxtafovial leak. As we all know that CSCR is a pachychoroid spectrum of disease with unknown etiology. Uh, uh, there is a serious detachment of the neurosensory retina from the retinal pigment epithelium. Uh, earlier it is thought that the pathophysiology is due to RPE dysfunction. Now it is states that it is due, due to choroidal dysfunction. Most of the CSER are central leaks, so it is a therapeutic challenge. Okay. Juxtafovial and subfovial leaks options are limited to photodynamic therapy and pharmacological treatment. The pharmacotherapy is questionable and the unavailability of PDT, here comes the relevance of our study. The micropulse laser are repetitive shots of words that last for microseconds. There is an on time and an off time. The short on time that limits thermal elevation and thermal dissipation to the adjacent tissue and a long off time that allows the tissue to cool down before the next pulse. The aim of our study is to assess the functional and anatomical outcome following micropulse laser treatment in CSER patients with subfovial and juxtafovial leak. It is a retrospective study. Uh, the data collected from, um, from our EMR, 18 patients who are diagnosed to have CSER in subfovial and juxtafovial leak treated with micropulse laser therapy are uh, taken over a period of 2017 to 2023. Our inclusion criteria is duration of symptoms, the presence of SRF in SDOCT in foveal, perifoveal and juxtafoveal location and the exclusion criteria is myopia more than 6 diopter uh, macular disorders. The diagnosis of CSCR was confirmed by fluorescent angiography and uh, spectral domain OCT. Study, uh, we studied on the anatomical and functional outcome based on the reduction of central subfovial thickness, SRF and visual improvement. These are the data collected pre and post operatively. Based on the guidelines of subthreshold ophthalmic laser society, uh, the, uh, titration of the power was done. Uh, he, our, our, uh, in our institute, we are using IREDIS IQ577 nanometer and the micropulse laser setting is 5% duty cycle, 500 hertz, zero spacing, spot size is 100 to 200 micron and du duration is 200 microseconds. And the results are out of 18 patients, 14 are females, 4 males, 4 females, uh, 14 males, uh, age group if between 38 to 78. The visual acuity ranges from 6 by 6 to CF3 meter. The anatomical outcome of our study is now 9 showed complete resolution of SRF post treatment and all patients showed significant reduction in central subfovial thickness and the functional outcome of our study is 4 patients with 6, six vision and 6 patients with 6, 9 vision and 16 patients had subfovial SRF, 1 perifoveal, 1 juxtafoveal SRF, 5 patients had poor visual outcome and showed absence of ellipsoid zone. Uh, uh, our study uh, show, shows a statistically significant reduction in SRF and central subfovial thickness following subthreshold micropulse laser therapy. This is a DFA showing leak in the early phase uh, that increase in intensity and uh, uh, size uh, after the late phases. This subfovial SRF pre and post treatment, juxtafoveal uh, SRF pre and post treatment, and this is a chronic CSR, uh, CSCR uh, pre and post treatment. And the discussion is coming to the discussion. In our study, there is a significant reduction in SRF and central subfovial thickness following micropulse laser treatment were noted. A study by Casey Soya et al. showed that 500, uh, 532 mic uh, nanometer of subthreshold micropulse laser was ineffective in CSCR and is, uh, did not show any notable changes in median visual acuity uh, and SDOD parameters. 42 percentage of the patients improved anatomically and visually. In our study showed that that 55 percentage had excellent visual outcome and 42 per percentage improved anatomically. And the Lutriel et al. Uh, analyzed the effect of a micropulse laser therapy in a, a small group of 11 cases with the duration of between 1 to 7 months, finding a total resolution of SRF in all cases regardless of the disease duration. The out, our uh, study also has a similar outcome. The, uh, the drawback of our study is number of laser sittings and the endpoint of laser are not predictable since it is a subthreshold micropulse laser therapy. 
uh, in our study out of 18 patients six need multiple sittings in chronic CCR the morphological success of the treatment may not be accompanied by significant improvement in visual acuity conclusion is subthreshold micropulse laser is an effective treatment option uh, patients with the CSCR and with the subphobia and juxtaphobia leak anatomical and functional outcome following subthreshold micropulse laser and CCR with as uh, was excellent and the functional result in subthreshold micropulse laser treatment is long standing csr are poor the prolonged presence of sr up lead to retinal thinning and loss of visual acuity these are my references thank you good presentation uh, see the thing is uh, how, how did you define chronic and uh, acute when do you call chronic csr so more than 6 uh, 6 months if there is no resolution of uh, subretinal fluid, it is considered as chronic. And acute, if, uh, if uh, uh, less than four months, the resolution of SRF is present. How long was your study? Sir, it's a, a retrospective study. Okay. And in among all the patients, that 18 patients that you spoke about, did anybody have recurrent? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's not mentioned it there. There's no recurrence in any of the patients who you take uh, the laser? When, uh, these patients do not have any recurrence. Okay. Thank you, sir. And next time, uh, Dr. Joshua, the next is Dr. Joshua the lady. Good afternoon to one and all. Uh, today I'll be presenting to, uh, to you an uh, emerging infectious disease of the cornea, microsporidial keratitis. Despite its clinical significance, it is often misdiagnosed and treated as adenoviral keratitis, leading to suboptimal outcome for the patient. So we aim to explore the clinical features, diagnostic methods, that is simple diagnostic methods possible in our OPD. And we assess the treatment outcome along with clinical distinction from adenoviral keratoconjunctivitis. So we conducted a retrospective analysis in our tertiary center on patients presenting with symptoms of keratoconjunctivitis from 2020 for the next three years. And EMR of the patients who were diagnosed earlier with microsporidial keratitis or adenoviral disease were reviewed. Uh, the clinical characteristics and all other uh, duration of symptoms and findings were also documented. We also uh, utilized the coronial uh, scrapings and anterior segment OCT to confirm the diagnosis. Treatment outcome and visual uh, treatment modalities and visual outcomes were also assessed. So, among the total 58 patients who presented with keratoconjunctivitis, we had 22 patients who had uh, diagnosed as microsporidiosis as primary diagnosis. There were 10 patients who were uh, treated elsewhere and misdiagnosed as adenoviral disease who presented to our center and we had documented 26 adenoviral cases in our center. So uh, uh, the peak prevalence of the disease was uh, noticed in rainy season, especially in between the months of June to August. And patients with microsporidiosis also had longer duration of symptoms compared to its uh, adenoviral counterpart. So. Uh, Microsporidiosis patients, they typically had a unilateral uh, ocular involvement presenting as a uh, this, uh, presenting as a stuck on appearance on the cornea due to the presence of spores. And we can uh, see the SIDLAM uh, photograph showing the same. So among the, all the patients, uh, we had 31 patients whose visual acuity was unaffected. Earlier patients were treated with voriconazole. But later, after revised protocol, our patients were given only a symptomatic treatment which showed favorable outcome with resolution of symptoms and improved visual acuity, and, uh, thereby bypassing the use of steroids and its side harmful side effects. 
despite its uh, prevalence microsporidiosis is being under reported probably due to the misdiagnosis uh, the spores of microsporidia can be easily dislodged with a bird which can be used as a uh, simple op based diagnostic method distinguishing it from adenoviral disease so uh, we can see the anterior segment oct of the microsporidiosis patient where we can see the superficial hyperreflectivity due to the presence of spores meanwhile adenoviral keratitis patients that uh, present with bilateral diffuse punctal epithelial keratitis uh, subepithelial infiltrate and anterior stromal opacities uh, corneal epithelial debridement can be used as a may help in uh, decreasing the bulk of microsporidia but uh, uh, no uh, final outcome there was no major uh, difference even no specific drug treatment uh, was there were many reports of specific drug treatment but their effects remain controversial so coming to conclusion microsporidiosis has typical clinical appearance even though it oftenly masquerades it often masquerades as adenoviral keratitis we can in if there is any doubt we can use uh, corneal scrapings and anterior segment oct to diagnose the disease so increased awareness is necessary about the disease for optimal patient outcome thank you so the only diagnostic modality that you used was asoct is it to differentiate between the adenoviral and the microsporidiosis yes sir along with the uh, clinical based technique we, so we used the cotton bud clinical suspicion as well as asoct yes sir so the reason why i'm asking this question is because uh, see the thing is you in the asoct picture that we showed you showed more of this of epithelial reflectivity right in microbiology yeah Did you stain any of these patients? Uh, yes, sir. Some of the samples were sent for so gram stain. Among them, how many were positive? Actually, um, few of them were positive, but the the sample size was not adequate in most of them because they asked for at least three slides were necessary. Yeah. Because both the diseases are self-limiting, both are actually self-limiting. Okay, only if the stroma is involved can become the different thing. But the epithelial variety of both or most of them are self-limiting, right? So how do you know which one is which? In uh, microsporidia, it is basically superficial hyperreflectivity. It may not be. It may not be. Thanks. Yes, So good afternoon, one and all. My paper is on the topic visual impairment assessment efficacy with electroretinogram in children on vigabatrin, a descriptive study. So vigabatrin is an anti-epileptic drug which is indicated only in refractory seizures in children. But the major ocular adverse effect is retinal toxicity, which is manifested as visual field loss and is estimated to have a prevalence of about 30 to 40 percent. But for most children on vigabatrin, a normal vision or field assessment is not possible due to their young age or neurodevelopmental delay. So there is a need for an objective test for the detection of the toxicity. So vigabatrin is actually acting at the synapses by inhibiting the enzyme GABA transaminase and thereby increasing the concentration of gamma aminobutyric acid, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter and producing anti-epileptic effect. So the aim of the study is to analyze the efficacy of assessing retinal toxicity of vigabatrin using ERG in a group of children with epileptic disorders. So this was a retrospective study at a tertiary eye care institute and patients on vigabatrin presented to our OPD in a time period of 2016 to 23 were uh, included and we collected the data from the electronic medical records which included detailed clinical history, functional vision assessment, ocular alignment and movement uh, cycloplegic refraction, dilated fundus examination, and electroretinograms on baseline visit and at three monthly follow-up visits. 
So the normal vision or visual field assessment is actually not possible in our subjects. So we performed a functional vision assessment. But it is not reliable in detecting the toxicity because it depends upon the general status and cooperation of the patient. So baseline and follow-up ERGs for these patients were done under oral sedation with the syrup chloral hydrate, which is a weight dependent dosage according to the pediatric prescription and according to the ISCV guidelines in the depot scan with GANS field illumination and DTL thread electrodes. Visually worked potentials were also recorded only in the indicated cases. So coming to the results, out of the total 20 study subjects, there were 11 boys and 9 girls with a mean age of 5.4 years. The major study population was below, three, below the age of 3 years. The mean duration of the therapy in the study population was 41 months, ranging from 1 month to 9 years. Only two study subjects had a longer duration of vigabatrin, more than five years. The major indication of the drug was West syndrome or infantile spasm, followed by hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. In infantile spasm, majority were idiopathic, followed by tuberous sclerosis. So this is the distribution of the baseline functional vision assessment. And we can see that about 70% of the cases had poor functional vision at presentation, which indicated need for an objective assessment. Moreover, two cases developed who had vigabatin toxicity on follow-up actually showed improvement in functional vision assessment, which is, which is actually contradict, contradicting to the effect it produced. So this improvement can be possibly due to better seizure control rather than direct effect on vision. So this is a table which shows the mean B wave amplitude and the oscillatory potential reduction of the values of the light adapted 3 point of flicker 30 hertz. So this is a serial ERG of a patient who had vigabatin toxicity and the top trace shows the baseline ERG and the subsequent ERGs on follow up. So we can see the gross reduction in the B wave amplitude from this picture. So this is a linear plot which shows the percentage reduction of the B wave amplitude from baseline through the follow-up visits in all the seven patients who had developed toxicity. This is also a linear plot showing the reduction of the oscillatory potentials in the patients who developed vigabatin toxicity. So in the VEPs recorded in case of suspected optic nerve dysfunction and pallor, the seven key subjects on dilated fundus examination showed optic nerve pallor and we recorded abnormal waveforms only in three of them and there was no significant correlation between the VEP and the vigabatin induced retinal toxicity. So coming to the discussion, the prevalence of vigabatin induced retinal toxicity from our study was 35% but it is slightly higher than Westerl et al which, uh, which, st which the study was the largest cohort of children with infantile spasm investigated for vigabatin toxicity but it is comparable to Maguire et al which is a systematic review. In our study, the percentage reduction in B wave amplitude ranged from 55 to 83 percentage, which was in the range of 37 to 52 percentage in Westerl et al. And the average reduction was approximately 69 percentage in our study. The reduction in the amplitude of light adapted 30 hertz flicker con electrogram ERG in, is associated with vigabatin attributed to feed loss. So the 30 hertz flicker ERG actually provides an assessment of vigabatin retinal damage in infants. The oscillatory potential reduction with the vigabatin treatment was also observed in our study. So there have been studies which showed male prediction, but this was not seen in our study. So coming to the conclusion, vigabatin has been known to cause retinal toxicity in long-term usage, hence assessment in pre-verbal population with a reliable investigative modality is of utmost importance. Our analysis actually indicate ERG as an effective tool for monitoring vigabatin-induced retinal damage in pre-verbal children. These are my references. Thank you. Good presentation and good study. Um, did you do VEP also or only ERG? VEP only in indicated cases like uh, the fund when we do a dilated fundus examination on those patients who showed uh, optic disc yeah. pallor. Okay. So otherwise, where do you uh, expect the damage in vigabatrin? Uh, um, vigabatrin actually it actually causes damages at the level of RP photoreceptors and bipolar cells. So that is the expected theory. So exact uh, mechanism of damage is not uh, still found out. 
but that it, is expected do, do you have studies on in adults to know where the uh, what kind of visual field loss is yes there? yes it was actually um, the um, toxicity of gigabyte has actually found in a case series of three patients who actually showed uh, um, intense um, visual field loss after a long duration of gigabyte therapy and that that is how uh, this visual field loss with gigabyte was yes, no. has come no has come to okay thank you Good afternoon. I am presenting a study on foveal avascular zone morphometry and changes with anti of in patients with non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy with clinically significant macular edema. Diabetic retinopathy it remains a leading cause of blindness among patients with diabetes. Diabetic retinopathy, a microangiopathy due to chronic hyperglycemia induced inflammation with release of various inflammatory mediators, the major one being vascular endothelial growth factor. It results in blood retinal barrier breakdown causing macular edema and also capillary occlusion. Normal foveal avascular diameter varies between 200 to 600 micrometer. Mean foveal avascular zone area in superficial capillary plexus is 386 micrometer square and in deep capillary plexus is 463 micrometer square. Due to capillary occlusion, a large irregular foveal avascular zone is present in patients with diabetic retinopathy. VEGF being the main inflammatory mediator, intravitreal anti-VEGF it remains the mainstay of treatment in diabetic macular edema. Though its efforts on diabetic macular edema is well established, its efforts on foveal avascular zone remains controversial. Many discrepancies exist among the studies, some suggesting an increase, others showing a decrease and also stable foveal avascular zone with variable parameters. In light of these discrepancies, we are doing this study to evaluate changes in foveal avascular zone after anti of injection and also to find out the changes in best corrected visual acuity and central subfield thickness after anti of injection. Ours is a prospective study. It is done in 35 eyes of 43 patients in a tertiary eye care center between January to June 2023. And the patients were evaluated for best corrected visual acuity using Logmar chart, central subfield thickness by spectral domain OCT, and changes in foveal avascular zone parameters by OCT angiography. The things analyzed in foveal avascular zone were the average diameter of superficial and deep capillary plexus and the foveal avascular zone area in superficial and deep capillary plexus. We have included treatment nail eyes with non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy with CSME and we have excluded these patients with other ocular conditions that affect the macular perfusion and those with thromboembolic events within 6 months. Coming to our results, our study showed a statistically significant improvement in best corrected visual acuity with a mean value of logmar 0.4 to logmar 0.2 and a reduction in central subfield thickness from 504 to 391 micrometer. Even though statistically insignificant, our study showed an increase in average diameter of superficial capillary plexus from 823.9 to 825.7 and in deep capillary plexus from 952.9 to 955.2. And foveal avascular zone area also showed an improvement from 551.9 to 553 and deep capillary plexus also showed an improvement from 611 to 612.9. This was also found to be statistically insignificant. Discussion. Thus, our study showed an increase in best corrected visual acuity and decrease in central subfield thickness with worsening of foveal avascular zone parameters. We have used ranibizuma, which is the commonly used anti of agent, and we have measured the foveal avascular zone parameters rather than the perfusion density, which were analyzed by the similar studies. Thus, despite restoration of normal retinal architecture with rejection in macular edema, which should show a decrease in foveal avascular zone parameters due to the centripetal movement with resolution of edema, our study showed a slight increase in foveal avascular zone parameters.
दिस वर सम ऑफ द स्टडीज विच शो डिक्रीज इन मैक्यूलर परफ्यूशन इन स्टडी बाई एलनाहारी एटाल दे फाउंड आउट दैट द सुपरफिशियल कैपलरी प्लेक्सेस डेंसिटी डिक्रीज आफ्टर इंजेक्शन एंड विथ सजेशन ऑफ इंजेक्शन द डेंसिटी इम्प्रूव एंड अगेन विथ इंजेक्शन इट डिक्रीज इन ए स्टडी बाय बाराश एटाल दे फाउंड एंड इम्प्रूवमेंट डिक्रीज इन मैक्यूलर परफ्यूशन स्टेटस थ्री मिनिट्स फॉलोइंग एन इंजेक्शन This were some of the studies which show an increase or stability in foveal avascular zone after injections. Thus, even though statistically insignificant, our study showed that macular perfusion is slightly worsen following single anti-vegetative of injection. So, multiple anti-vegetative of injections might further worsen macular perfusion, and this improvement in vision could be attributed to the preserved ellipsoid layer and better regaining of inner retinal anatomy due to reversal of disorganization of retinal inner layers and the relief of muller cell stretch with resolution of the edema. This also signifies that the regain in best corrector visual acuity is not related to the foveal avascular zone perfusion status. From the studies, it appears that the molecular changes that explains worsening of macular perfusion are due to decreased nitric oxide synthesis by endothelial cells and due to the selective knockout of vascular endothelial growth factor in local endothelial cells which have a prothrombotic effect and also due to the progressive diabetic retinopathy contributed by other inflammatory mediators other than VEGF. Thus concluding, anti-VEGF injection was found to be effective in improving vascularity, visual acuity, and reducing central subfield thickness. And foveal avascular zone perfusion status worsened following anti-VEGF injection. So long-term follow-up of FVZ is required in patients taking continuous anti-VEGF. So we recommend future studies with larger sample size and longer follow-up to confirm our diagnosis. These are my references. Thank you. Yes, there was an improvement in visual acuity, but the form. Yes, sir. So what what were the findings that showed you that the oh, uh, the FAZ for fusion actually worsened? Actually, we have taken the average diameter in superficial and deep capillary plexus, and also the area was measured both in superficial and deep capillary plexus. Are there other studies showing from the uh, findings of the audio of the audio? No, similar, uh, there are studies which showed increase in macular perfusion status and also decrease and also stable foveal avascular zone parameters following injection. Can you say the investigative modality? Both average diameter. We have used OCT angiography because in FFA we can delineate only superficial capillary plexus. In OCT angiography, both superficial and deep capillary plexus can be delineated. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I am going to present paper on choroidal vascular and morphometric changes after intravitreal aflibercept injection in polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, a retrospective study. Coming to introduction, polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy is one of the commonest exudative maculopathy that we see in our day-to-day -day practice. Uh, it is mainly uh, based, uh, diagnosis is mainly based on typical clinical findings including reddish orange subretinal nodule and subretinal hemorrhage. And diagnosis can be confirmed by uh, ICGA. In ICJ, we can see branching vascular network of inner choroidal vessels and uh, hyperfluorescence and hypofluorescent halo. Um, and uh, aflibercept is a newer anti-VEGF molecule which acts against both uh, VEGFR1 and VEGFR2. Coming to management of PCV. Treatment response of PCV is currently based on demonstration of intraretinal fluid or subretinal fluid reduction on, on OCT and obliteration of polyps on ICGA. Uh, but as ICG is an invasive procedure, it is uh, not universally available. Uh, recently, new choroidal thickness like subfoveal choroidal thickness and choroidal vascularity index have been described by various authors. Uh, study of the changes in these indices after treatment would be a surrogate for assessing the treatment response. Aim of our study to investigate changes in subfoveal choroidal thickness and choroidal vascularity index after intravitreal aflibercept injection for PCV. 
coming to materials and methods uh, our study was a retrospective study uh, study setting was in uh, study was conducted in a tertiary eye institute in south india study period was january 2023 to july 2023 uh, 34 eyes of 33 patients were analyzed in our study icga diagnosed pcv eyes were included in our study OCT uh, on Heidelberg spectral spectral domain OCT was uh, used for our study. Loading dose of aflubercept standard dose was given in our study. Uh, choroidal changes like subfovial choroidal thickness and choroidal vascularity index were analyzed in our study. Now, how to measure subfovial choroidal thickness? For measuring subfovial choroidal uh, thickness, uh, using a caliper tool, uh, we have analyzed. Uh, uh, vertical, we have taken the vertical distance from the hyperreflective line of uh, retinal pigment epithelium to the reflective layer of cor choroidal interface. Now, how to measure, measure choroidal vascularity index? Uh, for measuring choroidal vascularity index, we have used a software known as image software. Uh, first, uh, OCT image is exported into image software. Then, uh, then we have analyzed uh, uh, using the image software, we have used an algorithm known as Nyblack algorithm. Using the uh, Nyblack algorithm, uh, we obtained an 8-bit image. Uh, then this obtained 8-bit image is a binarized image. In binarized image, we can see black and white areas. Black, uh, black areas represent the luminal area and the white areas represent the stromal area. Then uh, using the formula, uh, then using the image software itself, uh, we obtain stromal choroidal area. Then 100 minus stromal choroidal area, we will get the luminal choroidal area. Choroidal vascularity index is actually total luminal area by total choroidal area. Coming to results of our study, uh, majority of the uh, patients in our study were male. Uh, most of the patients uh, in our study belongs to age group of 71 to 80 years. Uh, most of the patients had uh, one line improvement. Uh, in our study, there was a reduction in subfovial choroidal thickness from 388.9 to 333.1, which was statistically significant. And choroidal vascularity index also showed a reduction from 63.1 to 60, uh, 61.8, which was also statistically significant. Uh, when uh, uh, subfovial choroidal thickness as treatment biomarker, previous reports demonstrated that subfovial choroidal thickness decreases significantly after intravitreal injections of ranibizumab and aflibercept, while other studies did not find any significant change after bevacizumab and ranibizumab. However, our study found a significant reduction of subfovial choroidal thickness after three months of treatments of aflibercept. Uh, studies have also shown, uh, shown that aflibercept in comparison to ranibizumab decreased choroidal vascularity index better in neovascular AMD. These studies have excluded PCV, but our study found that PCV is also demonstrate reduction in choroidal vascularity index after aflibercept therapy. There is not enough literature in PCV is treated with aflibercept. Though it was observed that aflibercept was a better agent than ranibizumab in PCVIs in terms of vision gains and retinal drying, demonstration of choroidal vascular changes have been inadequate in previous studies. Our study demonstrated that aflibercept decreases the choroidal thickness in these pachychoroid eyes by decreasing the dilated choroidal vessels uh, and thereby reducing the intraretinal fluid, subretinal fluid and sub-RP fluid in these patients. When we compare choroidal vascularity index with subfovial choroidal thickness, uh, choroidal vascularity index is a better parameter uh, because uh, this uh, choroidal vascularity index is not influenced by age, axial length, IOP and time of day. Uh, coming to conclusion, uh, response to aflibercept in PCVIs could be gauged by non-invasive imaging like change in uh, choroidal thickness and change in choroidal vascularity index. Choroidal thickness in PCVIs significantly decreased after intravitreal aflibercept injection. Aflibercept treatment also showed decreased choroidal vascularity index changes. These are my references. Thank you. Three injections were given. Monthly three injections were given. Three injections. And one month after three injections, we were analyzed choroidal vascularity index and subfovial choroidal thickness. That you use for the uh, is that a validation method? Uh, there is a image using the image software. We have analyzed the new technique or that has been described already. Uh, uh, this is a newer technique. Uh, this uh, image software is used for other binarization of uh, uh, other purposes, like uh, but uh, till now there is no uh, no studies available.
about images software what was of its kind study uh, in uh, using for uh, coroidal was in octa there is stu studies available using octa but using oct it is the first study thanks So good afternoon. My paper for today is on knowledge, attitude, and practice pattern among ICU nurses on eye care practices in ICU patients. Here are the contents. IK forms a major part of care provided to all patients in ICUs. Critical care nurses have limited knowledge about the anatomy and physiology of eyes and ocular manifestations in critically ill patients, which may lead to a delay in the identification and delivery of proper eye care. My objective is to estimate the knowledge, attitude, and practice pattern of nurses regarding the eye care in patients admitted in the ICU in a tertiary care center. A descriptive study was done among the ICU nursing staff with a well-structured questionnaire. My study included 74 nursing staffs, participants' age, gender, education, experience in critical care, type of ICU, previous eye care training was noted, data was collected in the form of a questionnaire. Here you can see is the questionnaire. It had three sections, knowledge, attitude, and practice, with seven questions in each section. The questions and knowledge assessment were on different ocular signs. In, in the patients, there are risk factors, management with two or more correct responses. A score of three, two, one, or zero was given uh, respectively according to the response. Participants were again further grouped based on their score into good, average, and poor. Questions on attitude was based on the importance of early detection, treatment, and prevention of eye disease. Positive response was given a score one, and negative a response of zero. Depending on the total score, attitude was again further graded into good, average, and poor. Now, practice again was assessed based on the method and techniques of eye care pra practice by the nurses in the ICU. The response to each practice pattern was again noted, and the partic participants were graded into good, average, and poor. Statistical analysis was done. And now moving on to the results. 74 of the ICU nurses included in my study. The mean age was 33.7 years. 92 were females. 93% were BSc graduates. 35 of them person underwent eye care training. 54% had one to five years of experience in the ICU. 20.3% were from the neurosurgical ICU. 78.3% of the total study participants had average knowledge. Most of the participants answered that ICU patients were at a higher risk for exposure to keratopathy. As you can see in the bar diagram, it's 86.48%. And least knowledge level was for the question on reasons for developing exposure to keratopathy, which is 54%. 50% of the study participants had good attitude. Out of the seven questions on attitude, maximum positive response is for the question of the effect of eye care in preventing eye disorders, which is about 90%. And least positive response is for the question on what to be done on seeing a patient with incomplete eyelid closure. There was no significant correlation between the knowledge and attitude score. Majority of the participants had an average practice, that is 54.1%. Maximum response was for the question on last assessment of lid closure, that is 78% and least response was to the question on the method of cleaning of the eyes of these ICU patients. 66% of the, uh, of the staffs uh, assessed eyelid closure in their last duty. 59.5% of the participants assessed, assessed eyelid closure hourly. 37% of the participants instilled eye drops 3 hourly and 6 hourly. 41.9% responded that they, uh, they had used distilled water to clean the eyes of the ICU patients. 50% of the participants cleaned the eyes hourly. 60% had done eyelid taping for incomplete eyelid closure. And 60.8% of the participants followed a fixed protocol, of which 28.4% of the participants responded saying that they got the protocol from their seniors. Now moving on to the discussion. 93% of the participants were BSc graduates and only 35 had undergone eye care training. Majority of the, of the participants had average knowledge and 50% had good, good attitude. And majority again showed an average practice pattern. So in our study, we observed that both participants with good knowledge and average knowledge showed a good attitude and an average practice pattern. And there was no correlation between knowledge and attitude score. Now, similar to our study was a study by Khalil and S. Attar. Now, in contrast to our study, a study done by Mariam et al. showed a positive correlation with good, at good knowledge and attitude in their study. And another study by Ebedi et al. showed that the participants had limited knowledge and showed a positive correlation to attitude. 
Now, majority of the staffs assess the eye closure of their patients in their last duty, and 60% of them reported that taping of eyelids for incomplete lid closure is similar to a study by Aditi Vidya et al. In a study by Sunil et al, less than quarter of the nurses responded that they were unaware of the high potential risk uh, of exposure keratopathy, and 50% of the nurses assessed, uh, uh, checked eyelid closure, and took preventive uh, methods to uh, to uh, to prevent exposure keratopathy. And an awareness program, along with a protocol-based approach, can improve the knowledge. Now, post our study, an awareness class was held in order to improve the poor knowledge and attitude. And here is our new protocol, which is which includes grade zero, one, and two, along with its treatment approach. Now, here is the conclusion: ocular com or complications can occur in a large number of ICU patients due to a lack of awareness, which leads to a delay in the identification and management. A clear protocol can improve the quality of eye care in in these patients. Here are the references. Thank you. So it's, it was our, our hospital, so it's a private, yeah, yes, sir, private hospitals. Yes, sir. And no, sir, the ICU doctor would inform us whenever there's a need of any, if they found there's any need of any eye-related uh, issues, they would call us. That's when we were informed. Not on a regular basis, only when the ICU doctor used to inform us. So some said that they did have an eye care protocol was there, but not everybody had an eye care training. Only few of the staffs had an eye care training, sir. There's 35. Uh, so 35, most of them were senior faculties who had one to five years of experience, sir. Most of them had a lesser experience, like around one or two years. But most of them who had an eye, uh, had higher experience were uh, giving a better, uh, better treatment, sir. Yes, and drugs. So there was no significant correlation between them. Yes, sir. Even if they knew their attitude was poor, it was bad. Yes, sir. If, if the attitude, if it, if it's with good, we can improve the knowledge, sir. But here, the, if the attitude is poor. Yes, so in my study, I found that the average, the knowledge was average, but the attitude was good. If the attitude is good, we can definitely give them awareness classes, uh, in, including with the protocol that I said, we can improve their knowledge. And so since there was no really bad practice pattern, so the practice patterns can also be improved. Thank you. Good afternoon. My topic is intraoperative topical antibiotics and avoidance of postoperative BCL reduces the risk of post C3R infection. Keratoconus is a non-inflammatory corneal ectasia and collagen proslinging is a treatment of keratoconus which increases the mechanical rigidity of the cornea and thus delay or even halt the progression of keratoconus. And corneal crosslinking is considered a relatively safe and effective procedure but there are certain complications reported associated with it which includes pain, sterile infiltrates, infectious keratitis, persistent epithelial defect, corneal haze or scarring, corneal edema, and endothelial damage. And infectious keratitis is one of the most concerning complications. Scarring and irregular astigmatism may develop even after the infection control and can cause impairment of vision. The aim of our study was to investigate if avoidance of the BCL postoperatively and use of intraoperative topical antibiotics could reduce the risk of post C3R infectious keratitis. Ours was a retrospective study in patients with keratoconus who underwent C3R at a tertiary eye institute from January 2020 to December 2021. And the patients were included as two groups. 
Group 1 comprised of those who were treated with post-operative BCL and intraoperative topical antibiotic was not used. And Group 2 comprised of those who were treated with intraoperative topical antibiotics and post-operative BCL was not used. In the Group 1 patients, initially under topical anesthesia, we debrided the central 7 to 9 mm of the corneal epithelium and thereafter 0.1% riboflavin was installed every 5 minutes and UV radiations of 370 nanometer was given at 9 millivolts per centimeter square for 10 minutes while continuing installation of topical riboflavin and postoperative BCL was kept and topical antibiotics and lubricants were given. In the group 2 patients, under topical anesthesia, initially a central 7 to 9 millimeter of the corneal epithelium was debraided and 0.1% riboflavin was installed every 5 minutes and along with that, Moxifloxacin eye drops was used intraoperatively every 5 minutes and UV radiations were given at the same, uh, for same duration and at same intensity while continuing installation of the topical riboflavin and moxifloxacin eye drops and postoperatively BCL was not used and the same topical antibiotics and lubricants as group 1 was given. And our study group comprised of 129 ISAF 103 patients which included 53 males and 60 females and the main age group was 24 and group 1 we studied 46 ISAF 37 patients and in group 2 83 ISAF 66 patients in postoperative period 3 eyes out of 129 eyes developed post C3R infectious keratitis and the incidence was 6.5% and all the 3 infections occurred in the group 1 where we used postoperative BCL and intraoperative topical antibiotics was not used and none of the infections occurred in group 2 where we used intraoperative topical antibiotics and postoperative BCL was not used and all the three infections were bacterial keratitis with an average day of onset of symptoms of two and all the three were treated with fortified antibiotics whereas two of them resolved with the topical antibiotics whereas one required penetrating keratoplasty. And statistical analysis was done using Fisher's exact t-test which showed a p-value of 0 0.043 which was statistically significant. Coming to the discussion, in the study by Rohit Shetty et al. who used standard protocol with the use of postoperative BCL, he reported 4 eyes out of 2,350 eyes developed bacterial keratitis for C3R. And another study by Okay et al. who also used standard protocol with postoperative BCL, he reported a case of 4 C3R MRSA keratitis. In Samora and Mills reported that patients with polymicrobial keratitis after C3R had history of handling BCL in the immediate postoperative period and postulated this could be a risk factor for post C3R infectious keratitis. And Samalis et al. also found that the use of the BCL and topical steroids prior to the healing of the epithelium is a significant risk factor for microbial keratitis. And in our study, in group 1, where we used postoperative BCL and did not use intraoperative antibiotics, 3 eyes of 46 developed post C3R infectious keratitis. Whereas in group 2, where we used intraoperative topical antibiotics and avoided postoperative BCL, none of the cases developed post C3R infection. Thus, we concluded that the use of intraoperative topical antibiotics and avoidance of postoperative BCL could significantly reduce the risk of infectious keratitis after collagen cross linking. These are my references. Thank you. The first question was how long did you follow these patients? What was your follow-up uh, schedule for these patients? We follow, the we follow up the patients in the uh, next day, then first week, and thereafter uh, one month, and then uh, for six months we follow up the patients. Ah, yes. So how do you uh, initially, uh, we after a couple of cases of infections occurred, our consultants uh, thought of changing the protocol, and I took the time period one year before changing the protocol and one year after changing the protocol. <coughs> So that is your conclusion. Yes, sir. So
because in the group two when we changed the protocol no uh, there was none of the infections whereas in the group one there was a num uh, three infections in the uh, post the cases yeah but the time period was same sir one year the time period was you that is We check the epithelial defect. Yes, sir. We uh, look the cornea, how the epithelium was healing, and most of the patients uh, tolerated it even without the BCL in the group two. Mm. <coughs> Yeah, that's a drawback of our study. We didn't uh, study each one separately. Yeah. In most of the uh, studies, uh, references, BCL was found as a culprit for the um, post operative infections. Therefore, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. Totally different ones. You don't have one in between where both could be. Yeah, we didn't try that, so Is we are looking. Problem of giving cyclopsis in both the BCL in place. No, sir. 